In the realm of futurism, we often envision the concept of a Dyson sphere as a stellar phenomenon. You are encasing a star completely in a sphere in order to harvest 100% of the energy it's giving off. Dyson spheres of that type, however, pose severe engineering and stability difficulties that would be extremely difficult to get past, and they also severely limit what that sphere can be like. As a result, stellar Dyson spheres, not swarms, those are eminently possible, are probably not practical in reality, explaining why we don't see them everywhere. Or maybe that's not entirely accurate. One of the most interesting aspects of Dyson spheres, as ridiculous as they may seem to some, actually beat all other technosignatures as far as candidate detections. There have actually been candidate detections in infrared for Dyson spheres going all the way back to the 1980s. To my count, there are 27 candidates and none of them were ever resolved. More recently, a group of seven candidates were detected in infrared. But the challenge with Dyson Sphere candidates is that we have limited ways of confirming that's actually what a candidate is. One method is to simply determine what it is not first. You want to eliminate natural possibilities in the behavior of the source. Then you want some independent indicator, a really good one being that the source is checked for coherent radio emissions. This was actually done with Tabby Star. The SETI astronomers swung the Allen Telescope Array to look at the star, but saw no radio emissions. This was before it was established that the material around that star is particulate, and not a solid object as a partial Dyson Sphere would be. The Dyson Sphere idea also suffers a lot of criticism on the materials involved. The usual argument being that planetary systems do not have enough materials to build one. This is erroneous, however, in that it really depends on how you build your sphere. Firstly is how thick you make it. They do not necessarily need to be kilometers thick to do the job. The second factor is what the diameter of the sphere is. If it's the diameter of the orbit of Earth, you will need more material than if it were the diameter of the orbit of Mercury. And the star type plays in. You don't need a huge sphere to encase a white dwarf or cool red dwarf. But one area that is not well trodden in science fiction or speculative science is the idea of building a Dyson Sphere, or more realistically a swarm, around a black hole. And in some ways this idea has advantages over doing it around a star. As spooky as it may seem to encase one of the scariest objects in the universe inside of a sphere. The fact is, if you have a Type 2 or Type 3 alien civilization on the Kardashev scale, they may need more energy than their own star produces especially if it's a low-mass red dwarf, which may make colonizing the environment of a black hole attractive because it can be a highly energetic environment that can be harnessed. And it has multiple sources of energy. The accretion disk of a black hole is insanely bright and energetic, as is the corona, which is the region between the disk and the event horizon. And the relativistic jets streaming off the black hole can all, in principle, be harnessed. In a paper by Xiao and colleagues, link in the description below, they detail that a stellar mass black hole, a small one, can have an accretion disk that emits several hundred times the luminosity of a main sequence star. Further, there is also Hawking radiation as an emission. However, that would be weak in this context, as the larger the black hole, the weaker this emission is. But the term Dyson Sphere is somewhat misleading in that it does not actually have to be a fully encasing sphere. It can be a swarm, or partial, and these often are all generically termed Dyson Spheres. The much more viable version is a Dyson Swarm, which are basically a cloud of energy detectors in orbit around the star or black hole. This is eminently doable as I mentioned, and indeed our swarm of solar-powered spacecraft in solar orbit do constitute the beginnings of a Dyson Swarm, though it is in its infancy. The researchers model black holes of five solar masses. 20 solar masses, and 4 million solar masses. The latter basically Sagittarius A star, the Milky Way's central supermassive black hole, and found that it would be possible with a swarm to harvest energy from the processes going on at a black hole. The big winner on luminosity though was the accretion disk. You would start there. This gives you a hundred thousand times more energy than the sun for a type 2 or type 3 civilization from a large black hole. Next would be the kinetic energy of the relativistic jets, which would increase the energy production fivefold in the models. 
highly advanced civilizations with some serious engineering chops could get this done. The question is, has anyone? This is actually a hole in SETI. Black holes up until recently were not considered good candidates for SETI searches. The environment of a black hole is not great for a planet to have life arise on it. There are high energy x-rays coming off that accretion disk, but a pre-existing civilization colonizing it would be able to shield from that, something that tends to get neglected in SETI, which focuses on civilizations living around stars and on planets rather than highly advanced civilizations moving around. There are too many unknowns with that, and you are unlikely to find anything by randomly turning your radio telescope to empty regions of deep space, hoping to get lucky and catch an alien ship. It really is a lot like fishing. Yeah, you can randomly drop a line, but it's much better if you have an idea of where the fish are in the lake. But as with anything Dyson related, the real key here is infrared. Here a Dyson swarm around a black hole would range multiple wavelengths from ultraviolet for really hot spheres and infrared for somewhat cooler ones, though still not very cool. You can't beat thermodynamics and such structures are going to be warm. The problem with picking one out though is deeper. All of the frequencies you would be looking at to discover the sphere are all naturally emitted by the black hole itself anyway. This means you have to use other means with which to confirm your detection such as changes in light and gravitational effects the sphere would have on the black hole, but it may indeed be possible to detect such a technosignature. However, there is one massive showstopper here. For a Dyson Swarm to be visible to us, it must be actively being managed and maintained by the alien civilization. Calculations done by Brian Lackey show that once a megastructure like this is abandoned, say the civilization that built it went extinct, and if it were a dense swarm, which it presumably would be, it would only last for mere hours to days in an abandoned state as all of the satellites begin to crash into each other, making for a variant of Kessler's syndrome, where each collision produces an increasing amount of damaging debris. At some point, looking at a destroyed Dyson Swarm would be like looking at a dust cloud. You probably would not be able to tell it from nature. Complicating this would be one located at a black hole where they basically join the accretion disk to eventually fall into the event horizon, think spaghettifying Dyson Swarm parts. It remains the case that while black holes might seem to be scary places to get your energy from, they beat most other possible energy sources in the universe, including technological methods of energy production like nuclear fusion. You will get more bang for the buck with a black hole. And surprisingly, black holes are actually rather stable if the conditions are right. And there is actually yet another energy possibility here. Just siphon off its rotational energy. At least until the black hole stops rotating. This is known as the Penrose process, which interestingly just a few years ago was confirmed to be a valid way to extract energy from a rotating black hole. Just outside the event horizon there is a region of the black hole where space-time is extremely twisted and distorted an effect known as frame dragging. This region overall is known as the ergosphere. Frame dragging is strongest here, and the process allows you to extract rotational energy. If you drop an object into the ergosphere, have it split in two, and one part fall into the event horizon of the black hole, where it cannot escape, but the other part can escape the ergosphere. It would be accelerated outwards, having received an additional kick from the close encounter with the black hole. The object flying out will have gained 21% more energy than it started with, and voila, gained energy at the expense of the black hole's rotation, and part of what you entered the ergosphere with. The black hole must be fed. But this also lets you do some strange stuff. This is the concept of the black hole bomb, the basics of which are from Yakov Zeldovich in 1972, and the runaway effect by William Press and Saul Tukolsky soon after. Here you are building something like a classical Dyson Sphere, but instead of putting a habitat on the inside, it's all mirrors reflecting back at the black hole. Black holes, while massive, physically aren't that large compared to their mass. That makes building something like a mirror sphere easier, and mirrors are easier to engineer than energy collectors in principle. By reflecting waves back at the black hole, they get amplified by the rotational energy of the black hole but it's mirrors, so everything bounces back and forth, getting amplified each time. 
And long story short, this leads to an explosion that can rival a supernova. From here you can open some windows and extract crazy amounts of energy, or leave it closed until it gets so energetic that the mirrors shatter and it explodes. Or the rotating black hole loses so much rotational energy that the whole system loses the super radiance condition. But the effect was demonstrated in the lab with electromagnetic radiation earlier in 2025. Why anyone would go so far as to build a giant bomb this way rather than just use it for energy generation is anyone's guess. But one interesting aspect of thinking about using black holes as energy sources is that it may actually be an evolutionary process type of thing. Right now the universe is full of useful energy producing stars, but in the far future those stars will begin to blink out and cool as cinders. This is a long way off, over 100 trillion years, but the universe will eventually grow dark. So there it may be necessary to colonize black holes in this way as they will be one of the few energy sources left around to keep your civilization going. If you can get to one. And even though it's there in a very expanded universe. But the universe seems to have given us a way to hack it here. I have no doubt aliens, if they are out there, are aware of this. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently not particularly interested in poking a black hole with a stick like this. And it has to be said, we have no close black holes, other than some tiny primordial one if those even exist. Just seems like a bad idea unless you really know what you're doing. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.